Welcome back to the Gallant Goblin. I'm Theo. I'm Grady. And today we're here to talk about week three of the RPG Writer Workshop. How has the week been for you so far? Um, well, I, I think I have officially given up. <laughs> oh no. Uh, but well, you haven't. Okay. These are very involved productions for any adventure, like regardless of how long or short it is. I mean, you need your art, you need your maps, you need. I mean, you don't need these things, right? But like, it's it helps. Being, and then the things you do need editing, playtesting, writing. Yeah. Yeah. So while you've been busy doing that, you had a list of nice to haves. And I figured that we kind of jointly discussed it and decided that it made more sense to focus on getting one into really good shape than to have both be running around really frazzled. <laughs> yeah, because I rely on you a lot for the editing, mm -hmm. for the, the playtesting, the feedback, the art, the maps. Like, you do a lot of that stuff. Just like in these videos, you do a lot of the post-production stuff and uh, along with the production, the pre-production. But, so we decided that we would focus on the one that had started. One at a time, basically. Yeah, <laughs> and then, so, I mean, also, you don't normally have to do these under a time crunch. You know, this is a, a project yeah. that's a little special that you're trying to get it done in a month, and trying to get two done in a month while having a full-time job, and... <laughs> and doing these videos. And doing these videos. Two like, videos a week now. <laughs> you know, it's a bit much. Yeah. So, okay. Um, but you're gonna put yours on the back burner, or you're gonna revisit it later on? Oh, yeah. Yes, Because we probably. still have, yeah, we still would like to, Oh, yeah. well, I mean, we'll be, we'll probably keep writing, I assume. You yeah. might, you'll, you have your ideas. Well, we'll see. I feel yeah. like I might want to, one of the things I talked about this week, kind of jumping in ahead a little bit uh, in the editing section is that once you publish on DMs Guild, that doesn't have to be the end of the story. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. It's not like printing a book that's out there and, you know, you can do revisions later, but new editions. But here you can really go and revise things once you get feedback on the store. That's and encouraged so, in some ways. I think so. Um, you know, it needs to be in good shape when you put it up, but you know, it's not bad to go back and touch things up, revise, yeah. uh, hopefully minor things, but you never know. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm hoping that, you know, get this out there, see what the feedback is. Hopefully I get some feedback and, and revise this for a while until I'm really happy with it because yeah. I think that's a good place to start. And right. then I kind of have ideas, very vague ideas for future things that may tie off of the one I'm doing now. Yeah, so, okay, so not necessarily a direct sequel, but Maybe. We'll see. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but yeah, do you want to talk about how the courses have been? Uh, I have barely skimmed the courses, okay. so I'm going to rely on you to go over sure. that. So uh, the first one that I guess we'll start with today is designing an eye-catching cover. And I didn't you know, look too much into this one just because <laughs> I had commissioned an artist that we talked about last time, Victor Tan, to do uh, a cover for me. Um, we've been trying to figure out the like the font, <laughs> the, the stuff that goes on top of the art, the yeah. font, the little graphics, kind of what size. Um, he sent me a message yesterday saying, "Oh, I found this uh, thing on DMs Guild that tells me that kind of is an overlay for Photoshop," mm -hmm. and he showed me kind of a little mock-up, and I was like, "Oh, I don't like that." <laughs> um, the, 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 what he had found independently was like the words were, the title was really large. Yeah. Um, and I was like, I don't want to cover that much of your beautiful art. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, so I think, you know, I thought I, I sent mean, him back. The D and D books, right? The wizards books are probably a good, I sent him a picture of a cover of yeah. the monster manual to show like, yeah, yeah, the font's much smaller than that. So yeah. whatever he had found, I was like, mm, let's back off of that just a little bit. And he's like, you know, don't worry about it. Like I'm just kind of getting the spacing together right. and we can put that on later on because we're going to do it independently anyway. Yeah. But, um, so yeah, but the, the cover, uh, I'm really still excited for. I'm still waiting to see, uh, how close, I mean, I've gotten sketches and updates and renders and things and you haven't seen it at all yet. Nope. <laughs> Nothing. You haven't seen any hints. I did have to tell you what the cover image was because you were telling me, oh, we need a picture of this thing that's in there. And I was like, okay, we have one. He's like, you should have something to show the uh, players at some point. I'm like, yeah, that's going to be the cover. So we'll show you that when we get it. Um, but yeah, the eye-catching cover, uh, the workshop seemed good. There's a lot of good resource, resources out there to be able to do this. One of the tools I found that can help with the cover design actually kind of plays into the next lesson. So let's go into that. It was Layout 101, the quick and dirty tips for getting your whole project in a presentable form for upload. Mm -hmm. So I had started using Ulysses on the Apple computer 
which is just a very simple Markdown editor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really wanted it to get it in a format that looks like a Dungeons and Dragons book. Mm -hmm. Especially when I was playtesting it, I thought, you know, I need it to be what I'm used to seeing when <laughs> I when I GM a game. Mm -hmm. And so I was trying to find. I didn't find a good, well, I didn't look very hard, but I didn't find a good style export for Ulysses to put it in that format yet. Um, but I, I saw some, there were other options out there. Mm -hmm. Before this lesson came out, I was looking at this, so mm -hmm. I didn't have all the, the, the hints. But uh, they have a, like a formatting thing, a template for Microsoft Word on oh. DMs Guild. Okay. I think that's an official one from them. It but I think it's older. It's it a does little not older. look like the source books. No, I think it looks like maybe older source books or something. Word is a very, Word is a word processor. It is not a layout editor. Yeah. It is very poor at doing anything. If you want to split it into two columns, you can kind of do that, yeah. but that's pretty much the extent of it. Trying to use text boxes and stuff, it's a disaster. So yeah, I would not recommend that. So I didn't use Word because I don't have Word. <laughs> that too. Um, but someone had gone and I guess, taken that word template and turned it into one for pages on the apple mm -hmm. um, which is i think a little bit better about kind of layout so i started with that template and used it to get my thing in order for playtesting. Mm -hmm. and it kind of came out and i'm just going to show you a little bit kind of looking like this a little bit which is not bad it was you know not exactly what you would see for a official book but it was the head text boxes. It was passable, yeah. Yeah, and it worked. It worked fine for mm -hmm. me. Um, but looking at this lesson, you know, they talk to you about how to use like Microsoft Word if you have to. Um, but the one that intrigued me the most and the one I really paid attention to was GM Binder, mm -hmm. uh, which I had dabbled with just a little bit before. It's a very interesting product. Have you looked at it at all? Just what you've shown me. Okay. So GM Binder, they give you half of a screen that's just a very simple markdown language slash HTML editor. And on the right-hand side, you see the preview of what the output's gonna look like. And it looks like, almost like an official Dungeons and Dragons book. It's fantastic, I love it. And um, putting your information in there is not so hard. If you started with something the way they recommended using the Markdown language, mm -hmm. you can almost just copy-paste the majority of it in there. And you have to fiddle with it a little bit for the special things, like mm -hmm. the, if you have tables, if you have images, if you have box text. Um, but you, you basically type it in there for things that are special, like if you want to put a spell or a monster stat block, they have a little drop down menu and you say, I want to add a descriptive box mm -hmm. and I want to add a spell and I want to add a monster uh, stat block. And it puts all the basic stuff in there and it tells you, you know, just click here to replace all the various uh, text like the strength and the constitution and the abilities. Um, but super simple and it comes out looking just like a D, uh, a D, &D book. Mm -hmm. So I started doing that a couple of hours ago. Um, and you have almost, well, you have several pages of it already. Yeah, no, like I've got- A I went, quarter of it? Maybe. Uh, I got the first chapter, the introduction of the first chapter, and compared to the last one, I mean, it looks like this. Uh, you can kind of compare uh, the two here. Now, this is the old one, and this is the new one. So a little bit more formatting. And a little bit more formatting, and but the, um, the key one is to show the, you know, with the stat page, right? Right, and kind so... Of, it looks exactly like... I was able like, to put, yeah, some stats like the D &D stat block in there. It took a little bit of work, but it's not too much. Uh, so this seems great. I imagine this is what most people use. Probably. To try to get theirs into good shape. Um, but it's certainly the one I'm using. It The learning curve was not particularly steep. Mm -hmm. Um it, the only issue that I have with it, and it's a product that's in development, mm -hmm. you know, um, but they, you really have to put your own column breaks and page breaks in there. They have to do that manually. It doesn't just automatically create a new page. I don't know why, um, but it, you have to do that yourself. Uh -huh. So if you put all this in there in your 25 page adventure and you're like, oh, I want to go add a picture of a goblin uh, firing a rifle. Um, you put that in there, and then suddenly all your page breaks and column breaks are all messed up, and you have to go fix that. Okay. So I think that might be the only drawback. Um, so, but you know, it's not a giant deal. It's, you know, it's twenty-five pages, so it might take you, you know, once you put all the stuff in there, maybe fifteen minutes or something to go fix it. Mm -hmm. And you probably have a little leeway because sometimes when you have a chapter break, you might have a, a column and a half that's blank. 
And so you have a little shifting room. So when you edit chapter two, maybe chapter three won't be affected so much. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I've noticed that sometimes with the art that Wizards includes <clears throat> is almost deliberately intended to kind of fill a, yeah. of a page. And yeah. they even have like tiny little sketches they put in corners or something sometimes. Yeah. And there's also these bundles of artwork over on Dean's Guild. Right. That's the free artwork that people have uploaded that you can go and add to your GM binder. You just have to upload it because you have to upload it somewhere and then link to it in order to incorporate it in there. Okay, so like you know, like well, not immature, but because you don't but necessarily want it public. But I'm sure we'll figure something out. I haven't quite looked in that to it that far. But well, yeah, we have our own domain hosting, so we can yeah always use ours. We have a website we'll coming. TheGallantGoblin.com. We'll cover that later. Yes, we'll cover that later. <laughs> um, but, you know, so that's the only issue. You have to link to images in order to incorporate them. You can't upload them directly, and you have to worry about the page breaks and the column breaks. But I think everything else is pretty simple. And so um, I'm looking forward to getting that in a, a state. So I finally feel like I, I can get into a state that's going to look nice for publication. All right, great. Um, and so that's what I focus on with that. And, and in the lesson they give you, if you're using other tools, and there's quite a few other tools, they link you up to external lessons to help you uh, learn those tools as well. Mm -hmm. So that's just the one I decided to use. The next lesson was editing your one shot. And uh, today you had just play tested mine on Friday and Sunday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday, honestly. Yeah. And so I let you get a copy of the whole thing and because you're you're quite good at editing, I don't know if we're gonna have Cassie do a run through of it as well or something. I think it's okay, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. If Cassie's out there. Um, so tell us kind of what you go look at when you go through editing. I mean, it's how easy it is to understand what's happening, right? So now that I played the game, so I've I've experienced as a player, but not seen behind the curtains, so to speak. Uh, so reading through it, just kind of reading your descriptions, seeing how much of it matches. And it's kind of a little surprising how much, well, it's interesting how much is going on or how some things read really well on the page, but sometimes don't translate as well in the game, depending on how your players react to certain things. And how good you are to GM. You know, I still like, um, you know, I get nervous running, especially something I wrote for the first time. And so there's certain things that are in there that I'm like, I don't, feel like ready to go to that next level of role playing or what have oh, you fair enough. at this point. And so like, let's just get the basics of the plot through. That's kind of what I was thinking. Yeah. And then one thing I'm trying to do and write in there too is put some advanced level notes. I'm going to go back and add like for the role for... playing. So when you're role playing the villain, like here are the basics for role playing the villain. Oh. But if you do, or if you're a comfortable GM, you're comfortable with role playing, here's some advanced things you can do to bring him to the next level. Okay, that'd be interesting to and read. so yeah. I'm gonna try to do it that way too. But um, anyway, yeah, so seeing that there's a difference between the ex thing you experienced in the game versus... Yeah, and I'm, I'm having to, it. being someone who again hasn't read a lot of these, I'm trying to have to hold back on saying like, oh, you need to add like, more details about this or that. And because, you know, sometimes you wanna leave it open for the GM a bit more than just, you know, overwhelming them with details. And you already have a few sections that are quite long in terms of I know. how I role play like I need things. to make it shorter. But, but I mean, and that's something that at least for me, reading through it, um, I thought it was actually quite enjoyable. Like it was kind of just like you start reading a book in a sense. And I know you had mentioned that kind of with the difference between like Xanathar's Guide and Mordenkainen's Tone of the Foes, where I was like, oh yeah, those are just both more rule books, right? And you were like, well, no, like the Mordenkainen one, when it starts talking about the monsters and stuff, it's kind of just like reading stories or reading yeah, lore. lore. And it's very readable just for entertainment purposes, not necessarily when pre prepping for research. Yeah. Um, and you know, I feel like a lot of your, especially your early sections describing the NPCs, you know, describing gaslighting, how a victim responds, how the perpetrator thinks of himself and things like that. Um, I thought that was actually quite interesting to read and I didn't have an issue with that. And that's part of the feedback that I did give you. Um, beyond that, you know, if something's confusing to me, I assume it would be confusing to the DM. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to highlight things like that. Uh, and then of course there's just the grammar or which sometimes I don't know how nitpicky I am. Cause again, going back to Cassie, she, she's very good at grammar. Yeah. She's better than I am. And hopefully I've picked up some things uh, by osmosis and, and not, and, and not being too annoying about it. But you know, I'm like- No, I want it to what? be as perfect as I can. Well, I mean, some things are a bit more, like we go back and forth a lot, me and Cassie, on, on comma usage. So Just she- Use an Oxford comma and you're good. 
Well, we actually agree on that. So thankfully, we don't have to kill each other. But uh, other things like using um, commas after, like separating compound sentences. In English mm -hmm. class, you're taught if it's a compound sentence, right? Two complete thoughts separated by and or but, you need a comma there. Apparently, that is not really the case anymore. Reading a lot of professional writing, people don't always do that either. So, you know, but that's probably boring to like 99% of the people out there. So I'll just stop there. In the editing lesson, they talk about mainly copy editing, uh, which is, you know, partly spelling, grammar, syntax, all the things that you're trying to help me with that we talked about. Also, you know, checking for consistencies in spelling. This is something that I complained about on Twitter is that when you're writing and these word processing softwares, especially on the Apple side, I don't know if Word does the same thing, but it tries to autocorrect. And so every time I type Grimlock, it says, no, you're talking about gridlock. And so I have to be careful that every time I type Grimlock, it doesn't automatically get replaced by gridlock. No, that's just when you go into the dictionary <laughs> and change gridlock to mean Grimlock. Right, or just add the dictionary. But a lot of the stuff is probably going to sneak in there, especially with D&D &D names and settings and monsters. So I'm sure when we go through looking at it. And then I also change the name of the villain halfway through writing the the less the the uh, adventure and one of the NPCs. So I have to make sure that the correct spelling, the updated spelling got, you know, incorporated through the whole adventure. Mm -hmm. So just consistencies in spelling and the way you do fonts and capitalization. A lot of that's taken care of with the layout editor when it comes to fonts and mm -hmm. how you do text boxes. Um, but also just making sure the facts are updated, uh, are correct and the consistency in the plot and setting. And that's one thing you were looking at too when you were going through it. Right. You know, trying to find plot holes. Yeah, or like things that are maybe someone might bring up as a question that the DM may not have an answer for. Right. Yeah. And that's a challenge too, because one of the things you want to do is make it concise and leave it open-ended enough for the GM to put their own spin on it. So I'm struggling with figuring out, do I want to provide answers for every conceivable question out there or just trust the GM can, you know, tweak it or, you know, add, make their own rules. Well, yeah, and I mean, but like, a, yeah, I mean, I tried to mainly point out the big ones, like, yeah, like you, right? Questions of memory and memory manipulation are very core to your story. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that should not be a mystery. That should be something that the DM doesn't have to tell the players, but that they should know how it works. Just what the rules are, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like. How many times can they use a memory? Are these memories from real people or are they mm -hmm. generated from completely f from scratch or mm -hmm. things like that? Like that I think is reasonable to provide information for just so that the GM knows what they're getting into. But like questions like, you know, like how did these two characters meet or how exactly were they abducted or things like that? Like those are things that the GM mm -hmm. can, can modify for their own purposes or just mm -hmm. because they want to. Yeah. And I think, too, uh, that's one of the benefits to getting somebody else to GM your thing and watching how they do it. Because when I am playing through it and writing it even, I have certain rules in my head that I may forget to put down on paper anywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I know how it works, but, you know, I might forget certain little things, assumptions that I have in my head. And so when I read it and when I play test it, you mm -hmm. know, I supplement the written word with what I have in my head. And so... Um, ideally, I would get somebody else to GM it and watch them do it. Yes, although I mean, I think there's definitely benefits to running your own module as well. I think you have to do both. I think, yeah, yeah. especially the first couple of times, I learned a lot. I did two playtesting sessions. We'll move on to playtesting. Playtesting was the next lesson, actually. Uh, so I was able to do two playtesting play sessions uh, this past weekend. <laughs> we had visitors coming in from out of town. Uh, we had Ansel, Ed, and Robert, and they came in, and we sat around on Friday night and ran through about half of it, and then finished it on Saturday morning. And it helped me realize, too, that this was definitely one that's best spread across two to three play sessions. Uh, that when you rush it, you lose some of the magic and mystery, I think. They got to experience some of the interesting twists and turns in the plot, um, but there's more they could have experienced if we weren't trying to rush through so that we could play board games. <laughs> And I mean, your second play session also was only about four hours long, right? So that was five hours, five hours, I think, completely. Uh, we did a second play testing session on Sunday where I... But they, they experienced even less of the story, right? Uh, a little bit less, yeah. yeah. Uh, that was Alex and Jack and Harry and Henry, and we all played online, and you set that one out. Um, 
and so I got to run through it again. But it was I was able to make adjustments from the Friday Saturday game to the Sunday game, especially in the first chapter. The first chapter I think was frustrating for a lot of you guys when y'all played it. Uh, at least it felt frustrating on my end. Okay. Um, and I tried to adjust things, and I think that frustration went away with the second group. Okay. Um, because part of mine is when you start it, you lose your class abilities because your memories were wiped. And so it's frustrating when you create a character and then you find that you, the, that time you spent creating the character, you're not going to be able to use all those cool abilities that you put in there. I mean, that said, I do feel like your second group was probably on average more easygoing. Oh, well, maybe. If both are watching <laughs> right now. I don't know <laughs> how they're going to feel about that. That's not a that's not a knock on anybody. No, that's and true. I mean I we love all of. I them. mean, and I'm part of that average that no. makes the first one. Well, apparently you thought so. No, well, part of it is you know I took away your class abilities, but I also took away your equipment to begin with, just because for plot reasons I wanted them not to have their equipment directly on them, but just hidden away a little bit. And so when your first battle occurs, you don't have your class abilities, you don't have your weapons, and so there's very little that you can really do to feel like you have agency. And so in the second time round, I let them keep all that equipment, and I let them have some nice uh, magical items to start with, because they're starting at level 5, so presumably they find maybe one uncommon magical item, and they were able to make use of that. Hmm. Um, and so uh, I feel like it went smoother in that first session. All right, yeah. Um, so, um, playtesting was really useful. Do you have, like, what did you think of being on the other side of the DM screen? Well, so I think one thing that needs to be set, uh, the expectation wise, is what a playtest means. Because I know that I eventually found out that your idea of the playtest was let's run through the story, right? And see how people solve the mystery, how mm -hmm. they respond to things. Me coming from an engineering and computer wow. programming background, when we talk about testing, like play testing a game or testing an application at work, that means try as many in as many ways as possible to break the whole thing. Yeah. And you're rewarded for breaking it in creative or not creative ways in my case. And so, yeah, so we went into the session and I immediately set out to try to break things in ways that weren't necessarily okay go ahead no, i'm just gonna set up that <laughs> the in this in the game to be to keep it very concise you start off being introduced right away to the main villain of the piece who's very much more powerful than the players are especially because they've had their class abilities taken away and so it's an overwhelming threat and he's not necessarily even starting off being antagonistic towards you mm -hmm. um and so Grady's way of trying to break <laughs> the system was let's immediately, he knew who the villain was, partly. Well, okay, to, to be well, fair, I yeah. did not confront the villain. I broke into his house not knowing it was his house even. Mm. Speaking of playtesting, let's just show a little clip from our first playtesting session. This is with Ansel, Robert, and Ed, and you. Mm -hmm. uh, this is when they meet one of their first NPCs and they really start to get a sense of what's going on, or at least they try to get a sense of that. Uh, this is after your character had met his end. Um, Barging into the home of the villain, thinking it was his own, yeah, and then refusing to back out of that, so the villain ate me, apparently. Wow, well, yeah. Um, and so, and so, like you were saying, right, these, these NPCs are have had their memories manipulated, mm -hmm. and they're kind of in a state where they, they've kind of accepted what's, what's going on, right? And if anyone else tries to kind of challenge their perception of reality, they get very confused, maybe slightly defensive. Yeah. So that's kind of what's happening in this clip, right? Yeah, and there's a little difference between the player characters who had their memory manipulation tampered with, and so they still, they know something's wrong. They know that they've been changed. The other characters have no sense that anything is wrong. They're just going by their everyday lives. Uh, they're still being manipulated, so they get defensive, as you say, mm -hmm. when somebody challenges that. And so they don't, even the NPC is a confused herself. So let's take a look at them meeting their first NPC and trying to sort things out. Yeah, uh, yeah, so you go and, and um, as you kind of knock on the door, um, you, you hear a voice kind of pretty faint, it's like, come in! I go in. So you kind of open the door and a little bing, 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 
a little bell rings as you go inside. Um, I assume this was the middle of the night. Did, okay. That's what I thought. It's kind of diffuse light. It's like uh, dawn. A little mist on the ground. But it's not, it's like dawn. Yeah. Oh. Because okay. my guy went to sleep at a weird time. <laughs> you had a long night. Yeah. Um, but no, it looks like a general store. You see, but you kind of hear the sound of like grumbling frustration, drawing your eye toward the back corner. Uh, okay. Then you don't see anyone there at first, but suddenly like a little head pops up out of the ground uh, or out of behind the, the counter. And and uh, it's a woman. It's like uh, a little uh, gnome woman. Uh, kind of brown hair, kind of a headband tied around her. And she's like, just a minute, will you? Oh, God, Belrod, give me strength. This crate just fell apart in my hands. Oh, don't just stand here. Come and help me. Come, give me a hand. Oh, watch your step, though. There's glass on the ground. Come on back and help me. I help her. I go to Caleb and help her. Okay. So you walk to the back and you see, yeah, you see a small, middle-aged, gnomish woman. She kind of beckoned you toward the back, and like you can see, like this is glass on the ground and like broken boards on the ground, like from this box that she was trying to pick up and this fell apart. And she's like, "Can you help me with this? I don't know what's going on today." Okay, how do I help? And so you can kind of help her, kind of pick up some of the stuff sure. that fell on the ground. And she's like, oh, "Bless you, bless you. How are you today?" Ah, uh, not doing so well. I don't even know who I am anymore. What do you mean, Volt? What's wrong? Is that my name, Vorth? Is that how you say it right? Yeah. Wait. Oh, yeah, I'll make a dry set. Wait, <laughs> so she thinks I'm this person, not my original thing. Hmm. What's wrong? Long night. Uh, drinking again. Well, you don't drink, though, do you? Do, do, can you, no, you, can you tell me about me and my friends? Like, do we live in the house next door? Well, it's just a joke. Is, is that our house? I really hope it's our house. <laughs> I see pulling my leg. No. We were attacked, we were transported, and uh, it's been a very strange evening. We're trying to figure things Attack out. Attacked where? Very strange. In the large, you? the large building. You were inside the large building? We just woke up in there with no memories of who we were. I. Who am I? Who are we? Do you know us? And Arthur, of course I know you. I've known you for a long time. What? I don't understand. What's going on? I just told you. We woke well, up you in the building. You made no sense. You were in the big building and you, you were attacked and you don't remember anymore. Yes. You yes. got hit in the head, did you? Maybe. I, we you don't know. You got hit in the head. The four of us. Well, now the three. Now the three? Uh, Do you know what Jono is deceased. Decapitated. Jono, what happened? No. He stabbed no. the... Oh, uh, I'm blinking with that. Mind flare. Mind flare. He Mr. stabbed the uh, door of the mind flare and uh, no. refused to leave. He stabbed Mr. M? No, the door. <laughs> he stabbed And then he tried to stab Mr. The, the him. What is going on? We don't know. That's what no. we're trying to... Have you helped us figure please out? Please sit down. Sit I, down. I'm going to run to Let the me... other house, motion for him to join us. I'm like, what? What's going on? Uh, come come join us. And well, then... I just figured we just woke up from like sleeping. No, we were very don't, tired. Don't My leave. Was... Sit down. Sit no? down. No? What on earth? Okay. Yeah. He don't... didn't go there? He, he, okay. You just want to run out? I'm going to like, let, let me go saying? get, what's your name? Uh, Lorne Hoven. I'm going to go get Lorne Hoven. Okay. Yeah. Tell him to join Are us. Are you sure you're willing to go by yourself? Yes. It's next door. Don't talk to Mr. M. Okay. Don't cross him. Okay. You know how he can get. Okay. Yeah, we just saw him. We saw him. So that was a little clip from our first play testing session. Uh, thanks to Ansel and Ed and Robert for participating in that. And you, of course. Oh, yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, it was uh, maybe interesting that, I guess, in our case, I think the players found the NPC's cluelessness maybe a little more... Uh, aggravating or, or not even that I think I think well, the problem was that you know you had intended it to be that the players would want to help these characters and that these characters actually have abilities that can contribute to the fight or the the, the escape um, and I think in our case the sense I got was that you know maybe they took away more that oh well these these NPCs are unreliable and so we can't we shouldn't be turning to them for help or we shouldn't be trying to get them to help us because you know, they're they're on his side, maybe, or or they don't know what's going on. I think all adventurers are skeptical of anybody they meet at first. Yeah. And so I think that's part of it is it's meant, designed for y'all to be skeptical at first. And part of the reason, part of 
the uh, thing I learned in the playtesting session is that it's good if it's not rushed. Yeah. That I really did want y'all to be skeptical at first. But to give them time to, to get to know to, them. And to run into a few more scenarios yeah. and understand what's happening. Because, you know, there were a lot of things that were going on in that town that we never saw. Yeah. And so, yeah. Because we were, I was trying to rush y'all through. and But it was a good lesson learned just to kind of see, like, yeah, yeah this is how people will react in this situation. Mm -hmm. And how, and I altered it up a little bit mm -hmm. for the next session. So, yeah, it's probably good when you first set out to do your play testing, and this wasn't in the lesson, but I think it's a great idea to let the players know, you know, they are play testing something and what the expectations are. You know, it may be good for your first couple of play testing, play sessions to say, let's just play through it like you normally would any adventure and, you know, uh, <laughs> just do as you would. And then, uh, especially if you have a regular group and you trust them and you know what to expect. Uh, and then in future play tests, once you've gotten the main plot and everything ironed out, you can say, now I want you to think outside the box, you know, poke at it, pry at it, and see if you can, you know, find ways that, of things that maybe you hadn't thought of before, and let's see if it holds up under pressure. Mm -hmm. But setting those expectations early, which I didn't do, would maybe help the experience for everybody. And so, you know, your character wouldn't die in the first hour. And again, I think part of my reasoning to try to break things as fast as possible was also that knowing we had a limited amount of time, you didn't necessarily have the luxury of multiple iterations. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, that's the play testing. And that was everything, every lesson we've had up to this point in the week. Um, at this point, what we're trying to do, I'm waiting for the final bits of art that I commissioned. Uh, one from Victor Tan for the cover and one from Hung Fan for one of the characters. Grady's been making me some great maps to put into there. What program are you using to make the maps? Illustrator, Perfect. Adobe Illustrator. It's a, t it's a terrible program for making maps. It's, there's nothing, there's not, no pre-existing templates to work off of. Um, so certainly- It's a tedious process. It, it, to an extent, yeah. Um, I mean, so I'm, we're, we're trying to emulate the maps that are provided in like Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Or the Dyson these, maps. Dyson Logos, I think is called. I, a little bit, a little. I mean, without not the hatching, without the without the more hand drawn qualities. It's yeah. very just grids, right? Um, but uh, yeah, so so you know, Illustrator is a vector based program. So you just you draw lines and then you yeah. draw more lines and then you mask things and change their. And, but you know, it's it's an easy way to yeah, and it's an easy way to be able to export at multiple resolutions without having mm -hmm. to rework it. And so, got some good maps coming up. Um, and otherwise, at this point. We got one more week left, mm -hmm. and I start work tomorrow in my regular job. What do we have? We have like half a week. Okay, anyway, go ahead. And so um, get the art in, finalize any changes I want to make. Uh, and I was going to also recommend uh, for because my adventure, if you tuned in last week, is about gaslighting, emotional manipulation. And I mentioned earlier, I've been kind of working with Satin Phoenix. Um, through her Patreon to give me some advice through this. And she recommended this book here uh, called Start Here by Dana Morningstar, or Dana Morningstar, uh, which has been really helpful to dig in here to help me really get in the mind of somebody who would do this and someone who's a victim of it. And also as someone who even who is the witnessing somebody else go through this. Mm -hmm. Because in this adventure, the player characters... Uh, are experiencing it to some extent, but they're also witnessing other people being abused. And part of the, what they're trying to do is help them. And so this really goes into how things that those folks can do to help the people who are being abused. And so I'm hoping that I can kind of incorporate some of the information from here um, into the adventure so that uh, there is a character in the adventure who's a bit outside of what's going on who can guide you and, and help you along if you need a little hints. And they may be able to provide some advice to that extent if the players are having difficulty knowing how to approach things. Mm -hmm. So to kind of help people get out of a bind. Yeah. Um, but this is a good book. If you or anybody you know has had kind of experiences um, with a, a, a romantic partner or even friend or someone who is emotionally abusive uh, and had me based like a narcissistic personality disorder. Uh, this is a great book to look into. Otherwise, yeah, we're going to try to get the formatting in order, get the art inside, get everything finalized, make any final edits, and get it uploaded to DMs Guild 
Um, they're going to send out information next week for uh, Ashley is on how to be incor incorporated into the bundle that they're doing at the end of this process. Um, so I think everything has to be done by early August, first day or two of August in order to be included in that. So I'm hoping to get in there for that. I think that'd be great. Um, but yeah, any final thing? What are you going to be helping me with this week? Whatever you say you need. Oh. <laughs> Editing, definitely. Getting those final maps in there and probably helping me with the formatting. Mm -hmm. You're very good and, and very detail-oriented when it comes to that. And you notice a lot of things I miss. Mm -hmm. So you'll help me with that. So yeah, if you guys are participating in this too, I know a couple of you are, let us know how it's going for you. What have you found challenging this week? What are you trying to do in these last few days or any areas that you're having difficulty with? Let's talk about it in the comments. Maybe I'll see you guys over on the Discord channel as well. You can always keep touch with us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And every like and comment and subscription that you guys give us on this channel really helps us keep making these videos because uh, they do take a lot of our time and money, but all those little little bits actually do help us a lot. So we appreciate your support as always. A lot of you always leave comments for us and we really do appreciate that. Final words? Yeah. Good luck. Good luck. We'll see you guys next time for our last video on the workshop. Take care. See you next time on The Gallant Goblin. Mm -hmm.